Back in early 2002, Nvidia was on top of the world with their GeForce 4 Ti series. With the Ti4600 known for its top of the line performance and the Ti4200 known for being very fast at a low price, Nvidia had all the important bases covered in the eyes of most gamers. But the card you don't see talked about that much is the middle of the road Ti4400. This upper mid range card was seemingly disregarded, with a lot of people at the time just saying to get one of the other two cards I mentioned depending on how much you had to spend. So today we're going to be looking a bit deeper into the TI-4400 and finding out if it was actually overlooked or just a pointless filler card in the GeForce 4 TI series. Unlike a lot of other GPU lineups, the specs of the GeForce 4 TI series can be summed up pretty easily with some cells in a spreadsheet since they all use the same GPU, so let's have a look at them. First we have the TI-4200 at the bottom. As to be expected, this card has the lowest clocks of the bunch at 250MHz on the GPU and 250 or 222MHz on the memory depending on if you got the 64 or 128MB version. For today's video, we'll just be focusing on the 128MB version as the 64MB card is kind of playing in a different sandbox. One step up is the star of today's video, the upper mid-range TI-4400. It sees a small but present clock bump on the GPU to 275MHz, and memory is also clocked at the same, which is a decent bump compared to the 128MB TI-4200. The best in the lineup is the high-end TI-4600. Now this card really starts to distance itself from the bottom of the pack with the core 20% faster at 300MHz, and memory 46% faster at 325MHz. Despite this though, the card was 100% more expensive. To understand what place in the market the TI-4400 had, let's talk a little more about what made the other cards in the lineup successful. First off, we have the TI-4200. Now this served as Nvidia's ultimate budget card at the time. As I mentioned, it featured the same full NV25 GPU as the flagship TI-4600, and given it was clocked 20% lower, they were actually not that far off in real world performance. With the price of just 199 USD, it was considered a very good deal, undoubtedly being the best priced performance of the time and still regarded as one of Nvidia's best mid-range cards. Additionally, the TI-4200 was known to be a great overclocker, usually being able to attain 300MHz on the core with ease, although memory overclocking ability would depend on whether you got the 128MB or 64MB version, as I mentioned the latter came with faster memory. So Nvidia had the mid-range segment covered with the 4200, but what place did the 4600 serve? Well this was pretty much the flagship card meant to appeal to Nvidia faithfuls. It was double the price of the TI-4200 and only performed moderately better, but still the apex card of the lineup and pretty much the best you could do for graphics back in early 2002, which naturally gave it adoption from the high end and enthusiast market. Now the TI-4400 on the other hand, it sat right between the two in both price and clock speed, so one would think this would provide the best of both worlds, right? Well, uh, not really. The main issue here is the card being 50% more expensive than the 128MB TI-4200 while it's clocked only slightly higher. As a result, at out-of-the-box frequencies, the cards perform very similarly. The only area where the TI-4400 could have an edge is in memory bandwidth, as it comes with 3.6 nanosecond memory that's 24% faster than the TI-4200's right out of the gate. It should be capable of some decent tuning as well, but we'll talk more about that as we actually get on to testing the cards. Needless to say, the resulting reception of the TI-4400 was pretty divided back in the day. To be honest, I'm not quite sure what the consensus was. I've seen people like the card and list multiple reasons in its favor, but I have seen more negative takes on the card as well, most of which just saying to get a TI-4200 instead for the reasons I just mentioned. So in order to find out if this card was actually any good back in 2002, I want to focus on three main questions in today's video. First, how does the TI-4400 hold up in games as a card on its own? Second, at stock settings, how much does it distance itself from a 128MB TI-4200 given its core and memory clock increase? And third, does the TI-4400 have appreciably better overclocking potential with its better memory and binned core? I really want to focus on that third one especially, as even though it was 50% more expensive than a 4200, it's very possible that the card had value in overclocking potential rather than out-of-the-box performance. To test this, we're going to be using a couple of setups with this card and my TI-4200. First, I tested each card at their stock frequencies to see how they would stack up in a typical out-of-the-box scenario, and then overclocked each card to the highest speeds I can manage without any advanced tuning or mods. I used Nvidia's built-in CoolBits software to do this, and in the end the TI-4400 was able to achieve 300MHz on the core and 325MHz on the memory, which makes it exactly on par with the 4600. Not bad considering it would have cost a good amount less at the time. As with the 4200, it was also able to get 300MHz on the core, but memory topped out much lower at just 260MHz. Really shows how speed had to be sacrificed to get 128MHz of memory on that card for cheap. 
This definitely counts for something on the TI-4400's part, as a 25% higher memory clock ceiling is quite nice to have, but we'll see how much performance this actually frees up in the testing. Speaking of which, assuming the duties of my old Sony Vio is a new AGP test platform. This time it's using an Athlon 64 3700 Plus and 2GB of DDR memory at 400MHz. At the moment it's nothing crazy, but it's going to be more than enough for today's testing and I have some plans to upgrade it in the future. Anyways, I'll throw out the detailed system specs along with the OS and drivers used, and without any further ado, let's now dig into some testing. The first game up is new to the suite, Call of Duty 2, and I tested at 1024x768 with the normal settings throughout and no AA. I also used 2 minutes of gameplay from the first level to get my numbers here. The stock TI-4400 cranked out 50 frames per second on average, which was only 6% faster than the cheaper 4200. When both cards are overclocked, the 4400's lead shrinks to just 4%. Frame times were okay all around here, and the game plays well on all the setups with the settings chosen. I will say it's clear to see that the game hardly benefits from the higher memory speed of the overclocked 4400, it pretty much feels the same when both cards are overclocked. Next up we have Half-Life 2. I used the 1024x768 resolution along with the medium settings and no AA. I used a standard 75 second run of the water hazard chapter as it's demanding and repeatable. The stock 4400 turned in 52 frames per second on average, which is still a small 8% lead over the 4200. Running the overclock settings, the 4400's lead shrinks again to 5%. Frame times were okay on all the setups, and on the whole, the game is a decent showing for both of these cards, but like Call of Duty 2, this game doesn't care much for the faster memory of the overclocked 4400. Freedom Fighters is the next game up, and this time I stepped it up to 1280x1024 and used the medium settings throughout. Also, the results were taken from a 60 second run of the first level. The stock TI-4400 pulls off a 56 frame per second average here, but still only improving upon the TI-4200 by 8%. When both cards are dialed in, the 4400's lead shrinks back to 5%, which I wasn't surprised to see. In addition, all the setups see a lot of stutter throughout the entire benchmark. Once again, the higher memory clocks see very little benefit for the 4400, which is starting to become a common theme in the testing. Next in our suite is Sirius Sam 2, and we're back at 1024x768 along with the low preset. I used a 75 second run of the Branchester demo to get my numbers as well. At stock the TI-4400 gets 34 frames per second, or about 10% faster than the 4200 at 31. When tuned, both cards are indistinguishable in performance, with the 4400 only able to lead by 1 FPS, or just about 3%, so pretty much within a margin of error. Frame times were okay on both of the cards with some large swings soiling the 0.1% lows, but overall the game was nicely playable on all of the setups. I bet I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but wow, this game kind of exceeded my expectations with how little memory clock scaling there would be. The faster VRAM is all but useless here. Second to last is Need for Seed Most Wanted, and I used 1024x768 with the low settings throughout and benched with 2 minutes of the first race against Razer. The stock TI-4400 actually pulls away from the stock TI-4200 here by 16% with 43 frames per second, which was interesting to see. When both cards are overclocked though, the 4400's lead shrinks all the way down to 4%. Yikes. All setups had some issues with the lows in this game as there's stutter all over the place, a little unexpected as the settings don't come off as so demanding to rule out a consistent frame rate. And finally we have Doom 3. Now given this game was a bit of a system killer for its time, I just went for 480p with a low preset as anything higher is pretty much a slideshow on these cards. To get my numbers here I use the Demo 1 time demo as well. Here the TI-4400 leads its lower end counterpart by 11%, and this lead shrinks to just 5% under the overclock settings. Overall the setups do fine in this game, but like every other test, the extra memory bandwidth of the overclocked 4400 hardly makes a difference worth mentioning. As an extra test, I wanted to try a synthetic benchmark like 3 Mark 2001 SE to see if we would start to see some scaling, but well, the results kind of speak for themselves. I ran all tests with the default settings and stock the TI-4400 is 10% faster than its counterpart, when overclocked it's only 6% faster, so pretty much in line with our game testing. So, was the TI-4400 worth the price premium over a 4200? I'd say for most people, no, absolutely not. If you were in the market for a card back in the day, the TI-4200 would have been a safe choice regardless of your budget. Stock the card offers plenty of performance for the 199 USD price tag, and if you wanted more, the card is a great overclocker, and can perform very closely to its higher end siblings with some simple tuning. But what if you're not most people, and wanted the full flagship experience without having to spend 399 USD? Well, the TI-4400 does have one key benefit, 
and that's being able to turn into a full 4600 with a simple overclock that most examples should be able to achieve. This essentially means that you can get the 4600 experience for a nice $100 discount, which against the 4600 gives it the definitive edge for me. Moreover, the 128MB 4200 can say the same here due to its much slower memory. Here's the thing though, as you can see here, when both the TI-4200 and TI-4400 are overclocked, the 4400's faster memory only has a very small impact on performance. So the question is, why? Well, I think it comes down to an architectural enhancement made in GeForce 4 called Lightspeed Memory Architecture 2. LMA2 introduced a host of improvements and techniques to preserve memory bandwidth, like lossless Z compression which allowed Z buffer data to be only a fourth of its original size without any loss in image quality, enhanced Z occlusion culling which made GeForce 4 around 25% better at discarding unseen pixels compared to its predecessor, and an improved crossbar memory controller that had a better priority scheme and load balancing to make more efficient use of the memory partitions. These aren't all of the improvements that came along in LMA2, but it covers most of the important ones. With this, it would make a lot of sense why in these tests we didn't see as much benefit from faster memory, as Nvidia alleviated a lot of the memory bandwidth issues by making the GPU a lot smarter in how it spent it. As a side note, you can also see LMA2 shine when comparing GeForce 4 MX and high-end GeForce 2 cards, but that's a story for another day. It's a bit unfortunate to say, but no, the TI-4400 wasn't really slept on back in its day. You'd have to want this card for very specific reasons in order for it to make sense, but even then I wouldn't say the card was a bad deal. If anything, I would say the TI-4200 was just so good a deal that you couldn't pass it up if you were looking for a good graphics card back then. Given the strong feature set and extraordinary value it offered, I maintain it was one of Nvidia's best cards of all time. I still think the TI-4400 doesn't fail on its own, but it just didn't make sense to buy given what was on the market at the time. I will say it did take a few months after the launch of the 4400 and 4600 for the value champ to become widely available, so if you bought a TI-4400 in the interim it would have made sense, and in the end given that it's easy to get flagship performance out of it, I wouldn't have felt too robbed if I had got one before the 4200 was available. Well, that pretty much does it for this review on the TI-4400. Even though the card didn't make that much sense to buy, it still had somewhat of a place in the market and it did pretty well in the suite of games on the whole. I've really enjoyed testing GeForce 4 Ti cards on the channel, but at this point, I think I've covered them more than enough. It's time for something different. With that, thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you all in the next one.